Well, that was certainly a splendid reader's theater. Thank you for presenting the gospel so clearly. Uh, the text is already alive among us today. John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Text like that uh, inclines us to remember Lauren Winter's uh, story about her 12-year-old friend, Julian, who as she was approaching church membership, giving her life to belong to Jesus, got cold feet and told her pastor father, I don't know if I can believe this story for the rest of my life. And her wise father said, in joining Jesus, you don't have to promise to believe this story for the rest of your life. What you're promising is to wrestle with this story for the rest of your life. John 11 is a story that requires plenty of wrestling. There's all kind of mystery in the story. And it happens early on when Jesus does this, I've got the message, Lazarus is dying, and yet remains two more days. And then the mystery of, is he dying or sick? Is he getting better? Uh, what's all of this? And then later in the story, uh, we can't help but try to solve the mystery of what's Jesus groaning about. Uh, this text solved the problem for us. Uh, it told us why Jesus is grieving. Uh, I think it was for his friends, right? John doesn't tell us that. The interpreter does. Because it's a mystery that's pretty hard to live with. In fact, our texts in English say that he's deeply troubled. Uh, Luther, and I'm told since then, the German Bible, interprets this very deep emotion as being rage. Jesus is raging against what? So there's mystery even in the way in which to interpret this deep feeling that Jesus has. And what mystery could be bigger than when Jesus does this great cry out and lo and behold, a man who's supposed to be stinking comes out in his grave clothes and they Follow Jesus' instruction, unwrap him, and let him go. There's a lot of mystery here. Commentator Gail O'Day tells us this story is an invitation to experience God's love in the world over death by believing in Jesus. Did you get that phrase? God's love in the world over death. And in believing in Jesus, we experience that loving power of God. I'm grateful that in this story there are different approaches that we can take. And we get this story over and over again, of course, at about this time of year. I'm inclined today to follow Mary as our guide. Mary, Martha. Let's see if I can get the story straight. Martha, uh, plucky, pragmatic, practical Martha. She tells Jesus like it is. Jesus, pretty crazy to open that tomb. It's going to be a bad smell coming out of here. Lord, if you'd only been here, you could have solved the problem. Martha is one who helps us engage the story because she approaches it with such great honesty. Jesus says he's going to rise again, and she says, yeah, I am the resurrection. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? She says, well, yes, I have believed. You've got an anointing. 
you're a, you're a child of God, maybe in a pretty special way. I think you're the one that was supposed to be coming into the world. Yeah, I believed. But resurrection and life, well, she can't quite repeat that. In fact, when she calls her sister Mary, uh, she says, the teacher, not the resurrection and the life, but the teacher is here. So I'm with Martha. I think she's a great guide in the experience of the mystery of this story, a mystery that won't be resolved, a mystery into which we're called to live as we experience the story and the life. So let's look again at those central words of Jesus. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Now, with John, we can look back post-resurrection to experience the life of Jesus. In fact, John is calling us to believe in the one who says, I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the way, the truth, and the life. In this cradle right here at the center of John's gospel, this emphasis on life is coming through. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the one who gives abundant life. And then in the next chapter, John 12, Jesus is speaking and, and says, I will be lifted up. God will be glorified. By this I will bring all people to me, to God, to God's glory. A kernel of wheat is a single seed, Jesus says in Luke 12, as he's thinking about this topic of life. But if the seed falls into the ground and dies... It produces a great harvest, multiple seeds. This mystery of life and death. So, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The next line. Those who believe in me will live if they die. A little different than it's typically translated, but the Greek read woodenly reads like that. Those who believe in me will live if they die. And then everyone who lives and believes in me will not die into the next age, that is the coming of the new reign of God. The one who believes in me will not die into that. So glad I was able to attend uh, Lectio Divina this week and got some help from my sisters there about what this idea of having death in one, one's life is about. They prompted us to think about that part of our life that might have been given up for dead. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a family relationship or a friendship over the years that we've given up for dead. And here's a promise that it, there may be hope for that yet. Or maybe it's a part of me. I've lost hope. I've lost zest for living. I've I've lost some goals that I earlier held and now seem out of reach. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. That part of you that you thought had been laid to rest, now there's hope there. There's also a sense in which this life that comes to us through dying to self is something that happens, as Gail O'Day says, in the ordinary rhythms of life. That's how 
I want to live into the mystery this season. I'm thinking about the ways in which things that looked dead are coming to life in inviting, exciting ways. Yesterday, I was at the lectureship that FPU, the Fresno Pacific sponsored. Melly was uh, the leader, the organizer. Happened to sit next to Pastor Paul Binion, uh, the uh, West Side Church of God pastor, host. He said, Lynn, I got to tell you, last year I organized a nonprofit, and that institution offered 36 homes to people in Southwest Fresno. They all have their names now on the title of the deeds of their homes. 36 new people living with home ownership. Resurrection life. How about the people who uh, die to a couple of hours of their life on Thursday afternoons, the second Thursday of the month? Stan and Stan and Dolores and Elaine and Audrey. When we're passing out that fruit and food to the, with the Exceptional Parents Unlimited uh, offering. You know, there's a little death to your own agenda to get there. But it's a sign of life. Now, are we solving uh, the hunger problems of Fresno by giving away those groceries? No, not really. But there's a sign, a spark, that there's new life coming, hope, resurrection coming to this community, a reminder that there's a new age breaking in. In fact, having exceptional parents unlimited right here on our campus is one of those signs that we care about this neighborhood. Arthur negotiated that connection with us. Oh, mentioning Arthur, talk about dying. The death of, of our ministry together is approaching. And it feels devastating to some of us. Like, is there going to be life after this? We've got all this vigor as a church. Now what? And the hope is that the new life resurrection that Margie and Arthur bring to the Baltimore church also in some ways allows for new life to come back to us here. Coalition to Dismantle the Doctrine of Discovery takes some of our congregation to Pasadena or Southern California to protest, to say no to taking away a place of worship for an entire people. What will happen? Well, we trust with Martha that somehow there's going to be resurrection life that comes out of this thing. The call is for us in these ordinary rhythms of life to be watching for resurrection life. That's the mystery. And in fact, it comes in very ordinary and practical ways as the story continues to unfold in John. Martha appears one more time in the story. It's in the opening verses of uh, John chapter 12. And she is leading the fellowship committee, fellowship commission, to a, another meal that's being offered to Jesus. Oh, those people, they're always eating together. Well, that's what makes them Christians. They believe in the power of one more potluck in order to experience the good news of God's life. Eyes open, ears open, the proclamation. Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life. Have you believed this? Yes, Lord, I, I have believed that you're the one coming, coming into our world.